fact, I just bumped into somebody in the hallway earlier and, and we ended up talking about it and he had a very different perspective on the whole talk than I did. That just happens because we had a collective experience and we're, we're walking around. Surveying the community, what could possibly go wrong? So there will be a very short answer. If uh, you don't know anything about your community, everything will be wrong. Just be ready for that. Um, if you know your community, there are still things which might be wrong, and we'll talk about um, many of them, especially specific to C++ and our community, which we're in here. Um, first of all, like, yeah, my name is Anastasia, I work in JetBrains, I think it's <laughs> clear. Um, so I was a C++ developer, it's sometimes sad to say was here, um, but yeah, I was a C++ developer before JetBrains. I did uh, eight years in embedded development, in networking, telecom, like launching the 4G LT network, and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with the hardware, which I really love, that's my passion. However, I joined JetBrains as a product marketing manager, knowing zero about marketing, but has a big passion for tooling and uh, knowing the community. Um, so you can find me on like Twitter, X now, um, and any other popular networks, I'm usually by this handle there. But the most important thing, if you are anytime around Amsterdam, please, please come to our fantastic meetup. Uh, if you come to meetup.com, find a Dutch C++ user group, and don't find, uh, like couldn't find a talk scheduled, maybe you're the next speaker. Like contact me and we'll schedule that specifically for the time while you're in Amsterdam. So we're hosting meetups in different companies, including JetBrains, and we have the fantastic audience there. So please, please let me know and come and join us. Um, so talking about surveying the community. So why I'm actually talking here to you about that uh, topic, which might be maybe a little bit strange here, whatever. So. First of all, I have lots of data, and uh, you saw Herb yesterday sharing our data. <clears throat> I actually have an update for him. It's 1% for Python 3 now. Um, so yeah, anyway, so we'll ha we have lots of data, and we're ready to share it with anyone. All our data is open, including the raw data, so you can take it anytime, do whatever slicing you want with it, and like learn something new about the community. But the goal of this talk is not just to share the data itself, and actually I mostly won't be sharing the data itself. The goal is to explain how to read this data correctly. Because believe me or not, but all the service we have in the community, they have their own context and perspective. And quite often the people are just, you know, grabbing one number from some survey and then use it everywhere. Whatever the context was, however the people were asked, what was the audience which actually passed through this um, survey. So it's important to understand why we have different data and what is the context and how this data was actually grabbed and collected because that really affects the way you should use the data. So just don't take it blindly, please, please. That's the major outcome uh, you should take here. And yeah, so we'll learn about some popular misconceptions in the context of C++. We are doing this service since the very, very first attempt we did in 2015. So quite a long time. Um, so we learned a lot and I'm gonna share these findings with you today. And maybe that will help you to avoid the typical pitfalls, errors, and biases if you do whatever research or survey you do in your company on your side and trying to figure out something about the C++ market. And actually I'm super excited because this is the first time in my life I'm not doing a talk about the C++ I love that much or like how to do things with it or the tooling I'm actually really passionate about, but about the um, market research, and it's actually nearly 10 years for me in JetBrains in January, uh, will be 10 years, and that's the first time I'm doing kind of marketing talk in that sense about the market research. Uh, but I'm not gonna like, you know, draw the marketing on you, I'm not gonna promote our tools to you. If you are interested in them, come to me later, I'll show you the demo. Um, so the most interesting question we'll start with is, how many developers are there in the world? Do you know? More importantly, how many professional developers are there in the world? And that will exclude students who doesn't have their regular job, maybe even a part-time job that's still a professional developer for us, and like those who are just, you know, playing with some languages for like as hobbies. So <clears throat> 
Also, more importantly, how many C++ developers are there in the world? Like, yeah, because we're about the C++. And how many professional C++ developers are there in the world? Because that's our major audience we are working with. So we want to know. And I would tell you, that's a tough question. There are no open sources that will op like answer to you on all these questions, even like just one of them. There are like articles, some media pictures, whatever, operating with some numbers. Uh, you usually don't know how these numbers were collected. You know nothing about their background. You know how trustable or reliable they are. And that bothered us for many, many years because if you're a company like ChairBrains doing tooling, we really would like to know the size of the potential market. So we spend a lot on that, trying to explore these questions. So, and the first issue we actually got was like, um, we need to define what is actually a professional developer because there is no single definition of a programmer in like any sources. So uh, the closest professions code say in the US documents to this definition is something like programmer, software developer, web developer. But for example, the typical um, like mis misconcern here is like the consultants. They are, they are included in some sources they're excluded in some other sources. So you never know if you don't have like the proper definition. And also if you ask, say, the game developer uh, or those who are doing the game dev, um, doing games actually, so who is the developer? You'll get so many answers because there are developers doing the logic, there are like uh, game designers, there are tech artists, there are like DevOps, and some people do call them developers. Some people do exclude them from this definition. And it's actually like there is, no easy way to define, like if you say uh, they are working with code, what does that mean, okay? So to calculate at least some numbers, we actually created the definition for at least our service and ourselves, how we treat the data. So for us, it's a full or self or part-time employed developer or a freelancer who has one of the like following jobs. So yeah, mostly it's like the regular software developers, but there are some other jobs we do include there. Um, and so we tried to use, we are trying to use this um, definition across all the sources and we have, when we have some external data, we're actually ex um, filtering this data based on this definition so that we always know that we're using the same definition across all sources and not comparing, you know, tomatoes with crocodiles because it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I know you were waiting for that number. So this is the estimation we calculated for the professional developers worldwide in 2022. It is a range because this is like, you know, market research, it never gives you a number. It always gives you a range plus like you can go 5% here and 5% here. So it's always a range. So how this is calculated, so I don't think I will be able to explain um, like in, even, a, even in a talk here, but like just briefly so that you can maybe believe me that it's trustable. So this data mainly is based on international labor organization uh, data, which is open to everyone, it's free. Also uh, European statistic data and World Bank open data. All free sources are completely free. We also do put on top the local sources. So we take the uh, United States Department of Labor, uh, various uh, Asia organizations like Japan, Chinese, and Korean organization working in that direction. There is a very nice uh, open source from um, like Canada, UK, Australia. So we do take all these uh, local countries' um, estimations and we do include them into the calculation. And we get this number and we do update it yearly. So. Um, we have already updated numbers for 2023. Uh, but like, yeah, generally, this is the number of the professional developers worldwide. And if you ask me how they are spread through the globe, so this is like the top seven countries. Um, and actually, there are 17 countries in the world which aggregates the majority of the software developers, the like pro professional programmers in the world. So generally, if you, made, um, if you are making a worldwide research, the goal for you should be just to target these 17 countries. Then you get the trustable data. If you take just one, and that's the typical thing we do, we like target, for example, United States, right? So you are excluding quite a big part of the professional developers. So if you want the true data, just go for all these countries. And you see US is not even on top. You know, there is this China 
it was quite many professional developers there. Um, okay, so what's next? So we have this big number and we have these like countries. Um, actually, then we take the estimation for each specific technology plus based on several surveys. So it's also not one source of data. So we do have developer ecosystem survey. And this is the survey we are doing yearly since 2017. Uh, this, this was the survey Herb was referring yesterday. So we do cover all the languages, all the technologies in it. Um, that's quite an effort. Results for 2023 are not yet published. However, they're already on staging. So yeah, actually, no. Nah just because that's another window, but I would briefly tease them for C++. So they are there, so they will be like public quite soon. That's just a small teaser. Um, anyway, um, so all our data are published along with the raw data. So usually we do publish a full report in several steps and then we publish the raw data so you can double check the calculation or do your own slicing. But also we do have, um, we do process the Stack Overflow survey, which is a quite good survey with quite many data collected worldwide. We apply some filtering and like uh, extract the data we need from it. And so we're based, usually based the calculation on uh, for the specific segments based on these uh, two sources. So C++ shares, let's try and calculate how many professional C++ developers are there in the world. So we got this fantastic number for professional developers worldwide in 2022. Okay, then we will apply this range of the share of the C++ uh, developers in the world. And here we usually take the questions which are referring to C++ as a primary programming language. Later, I will show you one more number uh, regarding the regularly used languages because these numbers are different. So these are the share of the people who think that C++ is a primary programming language for them. And yeah, so it gives us the number. Not that big one or on the opposite for some bill, maybe quite big, but we are more than one million of professional developers who do consider C++ their primary programming language in 2022. So in 2023, we have a slightly bigger numbers. And also I added the numbers of those who are regularly using the C++ as their language. So the first number, which is 1,157,000, is the C++ as primary language in 2023. And uh, 2,492 is the professional developers who regularly use C++ in 2023. Um, so because I got a question from uh, Victor on Twitter when, while posting that slide, I added the timeline. So there is uh, kind of um, a bias in this timeline for uh, 2018 when we were starting because our calculations were a bit incorrect. So we had this spike and then it got lower and then it like keeps growing for the years. So I won't be trusting the 2018 data because we have many questions to that, but still this is the timeline. So if we talk about the primary languages and the C++, so that's what we get. Also, uh, for regular reuse, there is like some similar picture there. Uh, you can see that we were, uh, we even don't have the 2018 calculation here because we were not doing that. Um, but yeah, it's very similar picture with like a similar growth. So I would say that C++ is growing. Uh, and yeah, it's kind of in the, um, in the top languages. So, but I, I think that's like not something surprising to you, right? <laughs> Okay, so um, let's go to the surveys. So generally in the community right now, there are three big sources of the C++ data in terms of the survey. Uh, there are smaller surveys, there are like vendor uh, surveys, uh, but like we're talking about some constant efforts happening regularly, like every year. Um, so this first night doggy is our developer ecosystem survey. We'll be talking uh, today a lot about its findings. And we'll be also comparing to the C++ Foundation survey, which also runs regularly. So uh, Foundation usually runs it uh, somewhere in the end of March, beginning of April, and they post in the data quite soon, usually in a couple of weeks after the survey. Uh, we usually slower and we have reasons for that, which I will try to explain. So we usually collect the data in uh, the end of winter, beginning of spring months, and we don't have a specific uh, time for which we run the survey, and I will also explain that later. And yeah, you see, we since haven't uh, published the data since that. We're gonna like um, 
publish the first wave, and the C++ will be in the first wave in October, beginning of November. There is also a meeting C++ survey run by uh, like uh, Jans on their meeting C++ resource. The biggest difference here is that's a continuous research. So Jans never published like this, uh, you know, points of time data. So he has this continuous data collection. So it's uh, kind of hard to compare to it in that sense uh, when you have this continuously coming data. Um, and also, yeah, uh, like foundation and developer ecosystem has these regular postings for a very long while. So we have an opportunity to compare, but you can still take a look at some uh, interesting findings at uh, Meeting C++ and Meeting C++ survey. Okay, so let's just compare the service and just try to understand the major differences between them. So we'll try to fill that nice table here. So, um, Developer ecosystem survey is running since 2017. We had an attempt to do a community survey in C++ in 2015. We'll also know, uh, talk about it a little bit later, but that was not a <clears throat> like regular effort. So our regular efforts actually started in 2017. And uh, C++ Foundation started running a year later from uh, 2018. And meeting C++ is kind of uh, continuous survey running since 2020. So developer ecosystem survey is global for all languages. It's not just about C++ if you're interested in C, in Python, in Rust, in how the DevOps are doing, in how the testing is doing in the world. Please refer to the data. We have all these sections there. We also have embedded. And I guess something else interesting to probably the people here. Uh, foundation survey is obviously focused on C++, so it's like run and owned by the C++ Foundation. Um, and yeah, meeting C++ survey is also focused on C++. And because of like, we have lots of people uh, actually, so the number of respondents is uh, totally different for our service. Like for developer ecosystem, the overall number of respondents this year was like nearly 35,000, but that's for all languages. Um, so yeah, and because it's global, we have like in total 527 questions, but we don't show them all to the respondents because that will be impossible to fill them out. So we have some strategy which questions to show, and I will explain that later. Foundation has 21 questions, pretty short, but all major topics are covered. Meeting C++ has like 88 questions, but they are randomly shuffled. So they are like, you're not getting all of them if you don't do like a specific effort. So in terms of C++, so I said that we have quite a big audience responding to our survey globally, but if we take the C++ and we're mostly interested in that right now, right? So in 2023, we got uh, 2,647 responses, and these are the full responses, so from people who filled uh, all the questions we were suggesting to them. Uh, C++ Foundation this year is a little bit less than 2,000, so 1,722. And yeah, so meeting C++ because it's continuous survey, it's hard to say how many they have every year, but like you can just try and approximate. Um, so there is a very important difference when you look at the developer ecosystem survey and C++ foundation survey. And I saw many times how this affects the data and it still keeps affecting. And so we have to talk about it right now to um, understand what's actually going on there. Because if you take a look at the foundation survey, they also Similar to us, they have questions like how many of uh, how many years of professional experience you have, like in general and in C++, and you will figure out that the audience of the C++ Foundation survey is much more professional. So they have more years in C++. So like in C++ Foundation data, 41% have 20 plus years in programming, and 27% have like 20 plus years in C++ which is a lot, like, you know, and this green bar, which is 58%, uh, 10 plus years in C++. So the people who are filling out the C++ Foundation survey, they usually have like longer, you know, lifetime experience with C++ and programming in general. I would assume that there are quite many people involved in the like committee and ICER and all the work around in there. Um, like our goal is usually in JetBrains to collect more average data. So this is done as uh, like with purpose that we try to collect the more balanced uh, data here so that we want to hear uh, from the people who are starting in programming who are like maybe less one, ye one year in C++, similar to the people who are like six to 10, for example, years in C++. So we want to know this like 
average data, so to see just on the picture, not shuffled to one specific angle. Um, yeah, and that actually um, has its, um, like it reflects a lot in the data. So I'm usually like joking that, yeah, so when I open, open a foundation data, I'm saying like, okay, I will see more people using Veeam and Emax, right? And that's actually true. Um, I feel old at the time, usually when I'm looking at the data because I was a Veeam user. <laughs> so, but yeah, generally that, that kind of has its um, uh, kind of, uh, picture uh, in the foundation data. Also, it's very interesting to see that we do ask um, in the uh, developer ecosystem survey if the people are actually regularly visiting the conference. And regularly in our um, data is at least two times in the last five years. So it's not really that regularly. So it's at least something. Uh, yeah, maybe for this year, the uh, pandemic affected this data a lot, but it was very similar in the past as well. So like, 80% do not attend any C++ conferences. These are the people who are filling our survey. So they, they don't probably look at my talk. <laughs> they don't know that I'm talking about them. And they're not attending the awesome talks we have here. They are not participating in these awesome discussions here. Okay, so uh, reducing the error and reducing the bias is very important. And don't get me wrong, every survey is lying. Like, because there is a bias in every survey. You can't avoid that. The question which you have to take and to answer is, in what way, how is it biased? Uh, who and when do you ask? And what can you do to eliminate at least some biases and know about the other biases and to treat the data correctly? So uh, we'll be talking about several, way, uh, several biases we have and the ways we try to eliminate them in developer ecosystem survey. And the first one is the sampling bias. And that's very, uh, Easy thing, it's just cleaning the data because when we get all the data and you know the survey is long, so to drive people to fill it out, we have some nice prizes like we're roughly like MacBooks and some other cool stuff. And so some people just want a price, right? So, and so we have to filter their answers out. Uh, I mean, they still can get the price, will be roughly for the whole audience, but we need a clear data and we need a clean data. So uh, first of all, we do eliminate people who don't select any primary programming language. So we are, they, they have their reasons to be there, but we're not that interested in their answers, right? So we want uh, to focus on those who are at least doing some reasonable work in some um, programming language. Uh, also, we actually do record the time the people uh, spend to fill our survey, and if they feel like 40 questions in two minutes, we'll just, you know, cut them out. Um, also, there is these identical answers quite often because the people would like to increase the chance to get the price, so we kind of merge them into one answer usually. So we still take it, but it's usually merged all in once. So what identical means for us is that if the answers are coming from the same IP address and there are 75% identical answers, we'll merge them into one, or if they're coming from the same email address and we require the email address to contact later about the price, we'll also merge them. And the funny part is the conflicting answers. I got contacted by our fantastic research department every year with some uh, interesting cases, and usually their question is, do you think that's a real answer? And then comes some great description. So the funniest thing we uh, learned from years was this uh, two cases when we got like 80 to 20 years old, people who are saying they're like 60 plus years of experience. I feel envy, I didn't code in like, two years or four years, uh, or 80 years old uh, CIO with like 10 years of experience. I also feel envy, I'm still not a CIO, so like, okay, so, but um, jokes aside, we just exclude these answers from the like real data and reports because the, we don't think it's very trustable. And uh, since uh, we can't, you know, verify it, we just skip it. Um, okay, then the response is burden. So, and it's a very hard topic for us because we really have a very, very long survey. So the people quite often, we do see the um, re responses not filled in full. And that's a big problem for us because we want a full data from the person. And uh, we try to kind of limit the number of questions we show to the person. And as I said, it's like, more than 500 questions we have in general. So what we do, we focus on the primary language. So if you say that your primary language is C and C++, we'll definitely show you questions about C and C++, and the rest will be kind of maybe not showing to you or randomized. And so if you select some languages as regularly used, we show it uh, these languages, uh, questions related to these languages, not to 
all of the respondents, but just to 50% uh, of the qualified respondents. And sometimes this regular reuse is very important because say if we collect data for Rust, there is literally no one pointing that Rust is their primary programming language, but that's quite often that the people do say that they use it regularly, right? So to collect proper data for Rust, we have to collect this regular reuse data, but uh, because the people have usually quite many languages they are using, if we show just all of them to everyone, that will be a burden. Um, and also, yeah, there are quite um, a few extra sections like CI or version control or educational sections or security, and we just randomize and like shuffle. So it might be a situation when your colleague was asked about the security and you were not. Uh, so no offenses, that just a randomizer. Um, yeah, and so usually the survey still takes 30 to 40 minutes. So the people who actually uh, went for it, they usually provide quite a reasonable answers, which are very valuable. And we tried to actually try to increase this number of valuable answers by like different uh, methodics. And we also do a lot to eliminate like our brand from it. And we'll take about, talk about that um, a lot, uh, a little bit later, but I just want to highlight that there are quite many sources in the community who do help these kind of efforts with surveying the community. So we do uh, collaborate with Bartek from C++ Stories. He has an amazing newsletter with 11,000 subscribers. And this year, for example, our collaboration brought us 240 free fully reasonable answers for the C++ section. And it's usually that number. So uh, we do promote a lot in their external sources. Um, you probably have seen my posts in CPP Lang when I'm usually like saying, hey, in the data, please fill it out. Uh, we do post to like various Reddits and other sources, but also we do collaborate with this uh, kind of newsletters with the reasonable numbers. Um, of the subscribers and the Bardic's audience is fantastic. I know some of you probably is following the newsletter. Yeah, great. If you don't, subscribe to it. It's really insightful. I like it a lot. Um, let's talk about the brand bias. So when you do a survey from the company like us, we have to eliminate the bias because we know that many of our users will be coming and filling out the survey. And we are interested in their answers, but we are also interested in the answers from the external audience. So uh, to eliminate the brand bias, we do actually lots of things. So apart from this sharing the uh, link to the survey in like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Quora, like newsletters, like C++ Stories, uh, CPP Lang, ready, whatever. So there is a long list. I'm usually going for it several times while we are um, like sharing the, uh, the link to the survey and collecting the answers. We also do limit the brand in the survey to the minimum. So it still says it's a JetBrains survey because the people need to know who are they sending their like, you know, data. Uh, but we try to keep it to the minimum. And also actually the funny thing uh, and the interesting story here is that we have a constant percent of the uh, answers coming from our customers. We just remove all the rest. So we have the number, we set it for ourselves that we want to have no more than this number of uh, answers coming from the customers and the others should be coming from the external resources. And we actually spend a lot on that because to collect the answers from the external resources, we're launching ads. Like you might have seen our ad on say Stack Overflow or somewhere regarding the survey and we pay money for that. But it's still a bias, so we can't avoid that. If you open the survey and say, look for a C line in the list of the uh, like used IDs, for sure, there will be a bigger share in the developer ecosystem survey. So I'm not surprised here. I just take it as granted. So it's 26% um, uh, in 2023. Uh, it's last in the C++ Foundation, and they have these different kinds of questions. They have the question about the primary ID and also the question about the journal usage for the, for the tools. And so you see they have actually this nice bigger share of Vim I was talking previously about. So, and I just know that they can't remove that. So I'm not trying to do that effort because I do understand there will be a big share of our own tool in our like own survey. And that's fine to me just because, but like when I'm working with the data, I'm trying just to align my, you know, appetite for the uh, proper survey. Um, but funny thing, sometimes those who are doing these uh, surveys like C++ Foundation, they kind of miss the 
mark at some point because in their survey I'm regularly seeing WebStorm and IntelliJ idea. Like in 2023, they had like free answers for WebStorm as their C++ ID and 37% as IntelliJ ID as their C++ ID. The funny fact is that both of them doesn't have the C++ support. Uh, but yeah, maybe the people like they still have Android Studio as a separate tool, so they're not mixing that. So that's probably something going wrong. Um, with the people selecting the answer, but like, okay, that happens. Um, regional bias is a very important one. And uh, so we do a lot to reduce this error. And uh, I was talking to you previously that there are 17 countries containing the majority of the developers. And so our goal is usually to collect the specific number of responses from each country uh, moreover, this year we set this goal that we want to collect at least 300 responses from external sources, such as ads, so that are not, you know, biased by our brand uh, in these 14 countries. The 14 countries is like a sad story behind that because it's 14, not 17, because we shut down all the ads in Belarus, Russia and Ukraine for this year. So, but generally we... Uh, had this goal, and that's why we actually don't have a specific timeline for the survey. So we are running the survey till we do collect this number of responses in the specific list of countries. And if we see that like we have enough responses, say in US and UK or in Germany, and we need to like maybe put more efforts into, I don't know, Brazil, for example, right? So we'll maybe slow down the ads in the other countries and put all the budget like Brazilian uh, respondents, so that we can still achieve this goal of the at least 300s. Um, also, the language bias is very, very tough. And it is, it's real. I mean, if you collect your survey, if you do your survey only in English, you will be super biased. There are lots of developers in the world. The biggest country is China, and they are very bad at speaking English, even very bad at reading English. So they will likely like skip your survey or the answers might be not very accurate. So we do a huge effort to translate the survey to eight additional languages. So we have like Chinese, French, German, Japanese, Korean, Brazilian, Portuguese, Spanish, and Turkish. That was for the 2023. So these um, surveys are located to these um, languages. And we do have like local ads, local promers, and we have like a huge team of regional uh, marketing people helping us with promoting the survey and using like some specific channels or specific um, like uh, not global, but local channels for like, for example, C++ developers. So we, we, we know where to share the data, to share the link to the survey to collect the data. So yeah, that's this uh, eight additional languages in there. And that really changed the picture for us. So when we started doing the developer ecosystem, it was English only. But then it was like, you know, opening the eye in the morning and realizing that the picture is completely different when you just added all these people. And you see like how much you actually previously include, excluded. Okay, so the statement bias is the thing where my input for C++ market, for example, is super important to our research team because this is the thing specific to the community. So the statement bias is actually how you ask the questions and which options do you suggest? Because this is the questions with the like, you know, suggested answers. So, and that affects a lot and we'll talk about how that uh, worked for us through the years. And so, yeah, I'm, usually responsible for C++, C++ and embedded sections in our survey. I also have a team who work with me uh, who are responsible for the like .NET section. And we spend tons of time just working on the proper messaging, the proper way of asking the questions and the options we suggest. Um, so yeah, it's about what and how, and it's about which options. And I have to recommend this book to everyone who is doing any community survey or any interview or any uh, activities related to the talking to your users or customers. That's the Rob Fitzpatrick book, The Mom Test. And in JetBrains now, I'm not allowing the people to join the customer interview now if they haven't read this book. Because this is a book about how to talk to the customers, not to get the answer you want to get, but the true answer because it helps you to remove this bias from your words. So because you have an answer usually in your mind, right? So you, you know what you're waiting for. And the way you ask the questions is often affected by that. So say, 
um, quite often the developers that come into the interview and say like, okay, so how do you feel about this feature? And the user is literally like, yeah, I like it. And they're, oh, it's super excited, so we'll do that, we'll implement that. But like then you try to ask like, what if we have this kind of functionality? How would you use that? And the answer is like, mm, probably I won't. I mean like, yeah, this person was super excited like five minutes ago. What has happened with his excitement or her excitement? So the way you ask the questions usually affects the answers. So uh, this is the fantastic book which can teach you at least a little bit how to eliminate this bias. So I really do recommend you that. Okay, so we started the survey story for us in uh, 2015 with um, this small survey we did, especially to start the C line project. So we were thinking about starting a C++ ID and we decided to ask the community many, many things. And we were super naive that time. Now when I'm looking back, I'm like, was it really us? I mean, like that, that's a huge face palm right now. But this survey was quoted many times. I saw it in Bjarne's book and Bjarne's talks. And it was like used by many people, but there were some big mistakes there. So. Uh, yeah, so first of all, there was, of course, no uh, like localization, and we were not thinking about how exactly we share, how many responses we have to get from this or that country. There was nothing like that in the survey. So we just share it, you know, like throw it to the world and waiting for the answers. Um, there was some um, quite a big biases and quite a big errors in that survey. So first of all, that time, the calculations showed us like, oh yeah, we're super happy. We have 4.4 millions of C++ developers. Are they students? Are they professional developers? We don't care. Like, yeah, we have a big audience. We'll do the tool for them. Um, we have a very inconsistent list of industries in this survey because we had like, uh, we had finance and bank banking, but we were excluding trading. You know, for C++, it was super silly. Uh, we had no embedded, but we have telecom, electronics, and I don't think we have IoT. So the list of industries, it was just like, I joined JetBrains half a year, um, like, no, a year and a half before the survey uh, was actually just started in our minds. And I was like, okay, I can think about some list of industries just coming out of my head. And uh, now looking at this list, it looks super creepy to me, but yeah, at least we got some data. Um, also, like, yeah, we did the biggest mistake <laughs> in the world. We mixed C and C++ versions in one question, asking people about which specific version they, uh, they use. We, I don't think we're ever doing this mistake again. <laughs> um, anyway, so we came to the, C++, uh, to the developer ecosystem survey later, and we started learning how to do things properly. And that was, for example, a very... Um, like important example of uh, trying to like, which I would like to demonstrate you, trying to explain that asking questions is actually hard. So um, we do ask the question about like moving to the uh, next standard. And this is the question from C++ Foundation. So they ask in the next 12 months, does your current project plan to start allowing additional use of the new C++ standard features? So, um, what issue we see with that when we try to analyze the data. So it might be good for the, as a starting point, like, yeah, so you have the person who have, for example, selected, I'm using C++ 14, and yes, I'm planning to start using some new features. But uh, the outcome of this answer is not that huge, what it, what it actually gives you. So what, do, what are you gonna do with that answer? So we learned that we need to track the paths. So we're doing these kind of things. We're asking you which standard you're using right now, and then we're asking you which standards from the above, like from the newer ones you're gonna use in the next 12 months. And so we have this recording uh, of the paths, and you can actually see it in our reports in this very way. So, and yeah, obviously the people you are in C++ 98 or free, they not plan to migrate to the C++ standard like majority of them. That's kind of, you know, an, uh, um, a proper way of answering here probably. So they, they have their reasons like older compilers or something which still stuck them to the older standard. And of course the people who are on like 17, uh, 17 standard are more likely to update to the 23 because like they're already on the cutting edge. So, but the thing is that it's super important to record this path so that we can see how the people are actually answering what is this uh, percentage. So what is the dynamic in the community? So it's not just like, yeah, we're gonna use a new standard and so what's next? Um, so yeah, upgrade paths are important. 
Um, then about the same thing about asking questions, which is actually hard, is about um, like uh, package management. So we do have a question about the package management. And we noticed in this and many other questions that the uh, absolute numbers and the like, because you, you can select several options. And so the total of all answers is much bigger for C++ Foundation than for us. And it was a very insightful moment for us when we realized that they add to this kind of questions, check all that apply. And we don't. And we took the raw data and we just calculated that. Literally, if you add, check all that apply to the survey, the people will be checking more, <laughs> you know? So that was like a wow moment for us when we realized that, that we're not doing, we're still not doing that because we want to stay consistent with the previous surveys. So we, we kind of can't break this compatibility right now. But that's the thing I'm just now trying to keep in mind. So I need to look for the trend, not to the, you know, uh, total of all questions. But these specific questions actually got me some hard time this year because uh, we are usually asking the external influencers to comment on the data. And I was showing you the, uh, the data right now. Yeah, so it's, you see we have Dayaga from Conan here. <laughs> and yeah, fantastic in Val and Bryce also this year. So Dayaga came to me and asked like, what's going on? Where is Conan? <laughs> so we were checking that and I actually specifically for Dayaga, I cooked these uh, plots through the recent three years, trying to check the trend actually and to figure out what's going on there. Because literally the trend in C++ Foundation is um, faster. So both Conan and VC package are growing faster in C++ Foundation than in developer ecosystem survey. And um, we were trying together with Tayaga to figure out what is the reason because uh, that's what actually the quote, he allowed me to use that. He wrote it to me um, in the email where we were discussing the results that they have very solid internal indicators to prove that Conan keeps growing solidly more than like 20% year per year. And so they have these large enterprises records and so they actually know they're growing. And uh, we were double checking the trend. In our trends, the growth was less than 20% and we were trying to figure out the reasons. And it looks like the trend is significantly slower because this growth for them is especially because of the enterprises and we have the small share of them in our survey. So that still needs to be like verified. That's still the thing we're working at. But that's just a good example how you actually verify the data with the experts. So you take someone who really knows what's going on there and you say like, look, this is the data we have. So does it look suspicious to you? Do you have any comments on that? So what we can do with that? And this is very important. So that's why we're actually pinging um, great people from the community every year. And thank you for everyone who has already commented that. Um, we keep asking them like, can you please check the data? Can you share your comments uh, with us? And it's not just for marketing purpose, you know, to promote the report later, but also to verify that we're not making some big mistakes here. Um, okay, then let's go further to the uh, questions and how you ask them. So project models. So uh, no surprise, CMake is leading in both surveys in foundation and in developer ecosystem for years. We saw that trend, how they actually took from Microsoft built and uh, went to this uh, fantastic heights. Um, again, there's like the absolute, the total number of answers is much bigger because they also have this like uh, check all um, that apply. But the CMake is a clear win winner in both. So just the absolute numbers like the, for this percentage is kind of different. But again, so partially it's because uh, check all that apply effect. But there is one more interesting thing here. You saw, you can see here Ninja. And it's not that big in developer ecosystem, but it's significant in C++ Foundation. So what's going on here? And I just checked the, the way we ask the questions and I figure out that Foundation asks about the build tool and we ask about the project model. And you probably could understand the reason why, why, like why Ninja is that big in Foundation. It's a build tool, it's not a project model. We treat it that way. Um, so yeah, uh, this kind of inconsistencies is always uh, interesting and uh, hard to dig in sometimes. Um, 
Yeah, then my favorite example, which I was partially sharing at my lightning talk on Wednesday, so about the uh, guideline enforcement tools. So we are asking about uh, the tool enforcing your guideline for a long while. Actually, we borrowed this question from C++ Foundation, but later they removed it. I don't know why. Uh, but we keep asking it uh, to stay consistent and because we're super interested. And we were looking at this big number of people um, like selecting different options, but for a very long while, I was trying to understand why there are not that many people uh, doing like at least any code analysis, why there is like 35% selecting none, what's going on there. Uh, then it, like the people came to me and you probably uh, know that company. So Sonar actually came to me and asked me like, why are you excluding us from the survey? And I realized that I exclude the whole CI thing from, from the code analysis stuff, right? So we added Sonar Lint and like all the other tools by Sonar, and they grab quite a reasonable audience there, so the people are selecting these code analysis. And moreover, we started asking in the global questions, we now ask people about how exactly they do the uh, code analysis. So like, because the CI2 matters, and we ask if you run it on your local machine or you run it on CI, how often? So we have all these kind of questions. So big kudos to Sonar who actually brought me this like, very simple idea, which was completely out of my mind. But also um, in the other sections where you can just, you know, type your favorite code analysis tools. For many years in a row, I saw a Clank format. And I was like, it's a formatting tool. What is it actually doing here? Uh, three years in a row, I was like, uh, pushed a lot, so I simply added it to the list of options, saying like, okay, let it be there. And you see what is on the third place. 21% of the people select the Clang format as their guideline enforcement tool. And if you skip my lightning talk on Wednesday, you can like uh, maybe rewatch it later because it's like a code analysis tool, but not really a standard one. It's uh, a Clang format tool, but it's not like a real Clang parser. And there are many, many things around. So talking about, for example, the standard tool, these were the numbers I've uh, showed at my lightning talk that like in, we have a tool which scans the GitHub repositories based on some filtering and like 8.65% of these repos actually have Clank format somewhere at the, uh, inside the project. So it is standard to some extent. So, and yeah, it doesn't parse properly as Clank. It just generates the um, annotated tokens based on a simple lexer, so no AST, no handling for includes. Quite a hard time dealing with macros when you have to explain, like um, in this example, how to correctly indent inside macros, you have to put specific parameters to your um, Clang format config. And there is this whole story with the templates, which I was playing with at my lightning talk. So yeah, but the people do treat it as a code analysis tool. And even I found that quote in the kernel documentation that Clang format actually serves for free goals for formatting the, the code, but also for like pushing the guidelines and checking the inconsistencies with the guidelines. Okay, so people do treat it as a code analysis tool. Okay, we'll, we'll just agree with them. Um, also, another thing which bothered me for a very long while was this um, like asking questions thing. So uh, we were asking about the unit testing framework that people are regularly using. And uh, like 41% of the people told us like we are not using any framework. I was like, I was actually scared. I was like, are you not doing any testing? What's going on there? Um, so yeah, that number was a scary uh, uh, number for me. But then I just learned that the people actually, they write unit tests but they don't use any specific framework quite often. So we simply added this option and figure out that like, okay, so it's better. Quite a lot of people are actually doing unit tests, but without just some specific uh, framework. And also we started talking to people about um, how exactly they do tests in their projects. Like maybe they're not doing unit tests, but they're doing like other type of tests. And we just learned that this scary number is actually not that scary if you slice it into different options. Because before that, I was like in this joke about embedded development when, you know, the teachers are coming to the airplane and then it's like announced that this airplane is built by your students. Half of the teachers are leaving, the other half keeps sitting saying it's not gonna fly. So, um, yeah, so no unit testing actually doesn't mean no tests. And especially if you slice for embedded development where the uh, share of the no unit test framework is quite big, it's not that scary if you slice for different types of tests. 
So yeah, some of the summary about asking the questions. So C is not C++. I learned that in 2015. Um, <laughs> yeah, C++ uh, upgrade paths are important if you want really to learn about how the people are migrating from one standard to another. Um, check all that apply really matters. If you want m people to select more options, ask them directly about that. Um, package management still requires some bigger investigation in the area, and we'll keep collaborating like with Conan and uh, VC package team to learn more about how this um, growing in the community for us. Project model VS build tool, uh, like mind what exactly you're asking. <laughs> it depends on your needs. And yeah, code analysis on CI matters. You can like literally see that quite many people are doing it there. And Clang format is not, but we use it that way. And you can see my lightning talk about that. And no unit test doesn't mean no tests. Okay, the last part. So um, we talked about the data, we talked about the biases, how we collect the data, how we ask things, but how to validate the data. Because when you get that big amount of data, the first question you ask yourself is like, is it a correct data? Can I trust it? Especially if you like in my position where I have to do the decisions based on the data, right? So I have to say to the team, we're doing this because I see this in the like developer ecosystem story. Um, so the best thing is to like, first of all, to talk to the experts, we already discussed that. But then do a little bit more nice things. So you can compare on the same audience slices different uh, sources of data. And this is a very important part that you have to compare on a similar slice. So if you just take, say, Stack Overflow survey in general and compare in general to developer ecosystem, you'll spot quite a lot of inconsistencies. But if you slice for the proper data, and thank you for everyone who is sharing raw data for their service because we can actually do that. So if you slice in the raw data uh, and like uh, just take the similar audience and then compare the data, that will be the proof. And we're doing that in every technology, wherever we can find the um, raw data from other surveys, we do this validation. Um, and yeah, it's good to compare on the same questions. So we collaborated with Herb a lot on aligning the uh, messaging for our questions. It's sometimes not possible because if we change the uh, messaging, uh, but we already got the answers for previous years, like we have to throw the data. Uh, I mean, the in the timeline, but um, generally, yeah, it's good to have one-to-one -one message correspondence. So we worked a lot with her, but just aligning our questions with the same messaging where it's possible. And explain the difference. And explain, I mean, like, not just prove you're right, but like try to figure out what's the reason the data is different. Say like with this uh, Vim users, if you see, like try to figure out why they're like selecting Vim. Maybe they just got used to Vim for 10 plus years and they don't want to switch to the ID and that's fine, but you need to know about that. So validation is actually the probative comparison here. So you're trying to compare and explain the differences. And like, um, as I said about the questions, so these are the questions where usually aligning two surveys uh, at and some differences between them. We already talked about that a little bit. So say in the package management, developer ecosystem actually asks about the third party libraries, but the C++ foundation, they ask about first and third party libraries. And I'm still wondering if that affects the data. I don't have the answer here for you, I'll be honest, but I just see that the questions are kind of different. Uh, Project models and build tools. So we talked to that about that a little bit. So we added this build systems to the question to align a little bit. But I think foundation is specifically asking about the build tool and they have a big shift to that um, like kind of aspect. And yeah, so uh, talking about the versions and what you regularly use. So we usually ask about the specific version. Foundation usually asks about the specific set of features allowed. In the, in the project, which is a little bit different. So you can match like the feature to the standard and put the data, but um, yeah, it has some uh, differences. And also, yeah, this, this is about the transition paths. So how we ask the things. So it's kind of aligned, but it's still a little bit different. Um, yeah. 
And so I want to finish this talk with uh, some big thank yous. So first of all, this whole work was actually not done by me. That's like exciting research and analytics team in JetBrains who actually do this amazing job. And there's big kudos to them because they really work hard every year to collect the data about the whole ecosystem, about all like, you know, all developers in the world. Uh, to Herb Sarder, who actually collaborated with me a lot about uh, this messaging and a lot allowing me to align this messaging into service so that we can later compare data. This year, commenters Diaga, Inbal, and Bryce, who provided some very uh, insightful input, and you'll read their comments in the report once it's published. And yeah, actually, Inbal for inspiring me to do this talk because I was previously mostly doing it as a lightning talk, but she came to me at Course C++ and told me, like, could you just speak in more details about that, maybe do a full talk about that. And that's how it um, actually happened. So yeah, big thank you for them. And if you look for some data, um, you can follow these links. The developer ecosystem 2023 will be also published soon, so you can find it there. And that's it, thank you. Yeah, and I can take some questions if you have some, so feel free to. Hi, good morning. Uh, I first want to say thank you for the work that you and others do for these surveys. I think they're a really useful community asset. Um, it's great to be able to refer to them sometimes when uh, speaking about what is or isn't popular or, or where the community is going. So I appreciate that. Um, there was a previous slide where you were talking about different build tools and their various popularities. And when I saw that, um, you mentioned on Ninja was very popular, at least in one of the surveys. And I'm wondering um, if that is accidentally pulling like transitive tools being used as opposed to things being directly used? Because I know, at least for myself and many others, we use Ninja, but it's kind of an implementation detail of how we use CMake yeah. as opposed to directly writing Ninja. Um, I've never actually seen a project directly use Ninja, so the numbers yeah. stood out. So yeah, I think is, like, that's, that, that's a very good question. I think that's too. related to the way we ask the questions because indeed the foundation asks about the build tool. And if you think about Ninja, it's like, yeah, it's implementation detail, but it's actually a build tool. We ask about the project model and indeed no one of Ninja as a project model. So we have less people selecting Ninja. Usually this Ninja is a part of the build process and implementation scale, as you call that. So, uh, but I think that foundation just triggers more answers, more people to select Ninja while asking about the build tool. Um, we explicitly decided not to like exclude Ninja, so we added it for the reason because we saw many people mentioning it in the other section. So we decided that it might be there, it has its like reasoning. So let's just keep it while we do understand that it's usually not a project model on its own. So it's more like a build tool, but the, just a way about how to treat the data. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have a question. How do you handle other when people do free form answers? <laughs> yeah, usually we do process the other. So we're trying to see what is the most uh, often uh, options there. And every year when we reflect on the previous year and try to update the questions, usually the research team is coming to me with this big list saying, these are the options from the other. You probably would like to consider them. And I have the numbers how often they were there. That's how I spotted the clank format in these other sections, because they were coming to me like three years in a row saying like, there is a clank format there, there is a clank format there. And I was like, no, it's not a code analysis tool. But like, yeah, in the end, I just agreed. So, but yeah, I get this list every year from them. So I'm trying to update the survey for the next year, usually with like the journal findings uh, from the ecosystem, my, what I have in my mind. We're asking our developer advocates and we're also handling this like data from the other section. It's very insightful to read it, you know, because that's the free text uh, filled usually with quite many symbols you can put in. Sometimes there are lots of things written there. Uh, very nice paragraphs. I do read them. Yeah, at least for C++ and C. <laughs> so I've got a few questions. I like what I've seen so far. Uh, you mentioned uh, advertisements and how to remove bias for that. And I've noticed I personally use uh, ad blockers. So I don't know if I've seen the survey or not. And I talk on a lot of uh, social media and there, I've noticed that a lot of people that, that say that they use ad blockers have a very different way of responding to you know, social interactions, whether it's online or offline. So I'm wondering if you're taking uh, ad blockers into account 
and that, that sort of like, you know, technical knowledge. Yeah, uh, that's a very good point about ad blockers and how we handle that because, um, yeah, first of all, for sure, like more than, I guess, more than 60% of the um, target audience in US at least use the ad blockers. So we're usually not relying purely on the like banners, like the banner ad, uh, especially in US. Um, so in other countries, it's slightly better sure in terms of like uh, how people do disable that. I mean, in marketing sense. Um, however, that like the promotion doesn't only include the banners. So we have all these different types of newsletters we collaborate with where we can, you know, insert some information. Sometimes it's even not a banner, just, you know, a text. Uh, we do collaborate with the uh, influencers in the community and they do share uh, a lot sometimes also in their like podcasts or also newsletters. Uh, we can put it to some like community videos sometimes when the people are doing like some, uh, I don't know, regular video news or something and we just put it there. Um, also, like, yeah, we, we just try to reach out to as many sources as we can and uh, just try to promote it there in like different ways. So it's not just the banners. So the banner is just a small part of this uh, iceberg. Makes sense. I wanted to touch on uh, multiple choice answers. Um, to me, there's a lot of a lot of situations where at my employer or even in my own you know personal you know, projects, I'll use different tools for different projects or even different tools for the same project. So I would want to be able to answer, hey, I've used this tool, I've used this tool, I've used this tool, and you know, be a part of that. But then I would also want to be able to, if I was you know on the marketing side for my employer, I would want to be able to, to dissect that and say, which tools are you using for work? Which mm -hmm. tools are you using for your personal uh, projects? And it, it I, I got the feeling that it didn't sound like that's what you were looking at in the data. Um, for uh, a multiple choice uh, answer. Yeah, thank you for the question. So the multiple choice is indeed a very interesting topic and we have these specific mechanics which sometimes repeat the general questions in the specific sections showing you the answers you already provided and asking you to slice it for the specific technology. So say there are lots of global questions regarding how you do the unit test or something, but then in C++ section we quite likely will ask you which of these are you specifically doing for C++, especially if you have more than you know, one primary language is selected, so you're probably filling it out for C++ and something else. So uh, we do repeat some questions where we want to know this uh, slicing specifically. So we just show you that you selected these three options previously in the global section, but what specifically you are using in C++? Well, I mean, even in C++, I, I've, uh, I've used Boost Test and Google Test for my employer. Yeah. And I've used Boost Test and Google Test and one of the other ones, I don't remember which, I mm -hmm. haven't used in a while. But answering both of those, I mean, they're, they're still multiple choice Yeah, to that's me. true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. We're not go going usually into that many details because then the survey will take like two hours for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that, yeah, that's a good point. Actually, sometimes I would like to learn more, but every time I'm coming with the extra questions to our research team, they're like, could you please you know, slow down, limit it a little bit because it's already too long. But that's a very good point. Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, you. You're talking about clean format and how it's not a static analyzer. Do you have a, a separate section? I didn't see it, a separate section for what formatting tool do people use? Um, I think we have. Um, I don't think we, no, nah, I think we eliminated that because it was mostly about the clank format in the past or some very specific stuff. Like usually the people, um, the same with the code analysis tool, actually the majority of the answers are like either using like nothing or using some standard tools which are standard in our mind or just relying on their ID. Like for a guideline enforcement, for example, like more than, I guess, 35% are just relying on the tool provided by their ID. So they just don't care what is there. The same for formatting. Like you, you don't want to think about it usually. <laughs> yeah, be it like a pre-commit hook or integrating the, your ID, you just usually, you just use it and you don't want to think about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I think we uh, finish here. So if you have any other questions, I'm still here around. So you can come, please, and have a nice break. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.